Warning. The following episode of The Bone Garden contains graphic descriptions and mature language. This episode may not be suitable for everybody. Listener discretion is strongly advised. Hello there, freaky friends. It's your spooky girl, Kate, and you are listening to episode number five of the Bone Garden podcast. This is a very special episode for me, and I'm going to tell you why in a second. But before I do, if you listen to the show, welcome back. And if you're new here, hello. I am a paranormal and true crime enthusiast, and I'm on a journey to learn about all sorts of freaky weird stuff. Now, I am kind of all over the place. I apologize. But you guys, you gals, you non-binary pals, it's my birthday. <laughs> I'm I'm a little bit scatterbrained. Um, oops, I did it again. This episode's a little bit late. I'm really sorry. I had a lot of stuff going on. I was feeling very under the weather. But we're here. We're getting it done. First of all, my birthday is Monday the 22nd. I'm turning 25. Also, on August 23rd, that marks one month of doing the show, and I'm going to get so sappy for a second. I never thought that I would be doing the show, and the fact that I'm already on my fifth episode is unbelievable. I am so over the moon. I am so, and I know I keep, I keep saying this, my air freshener just said it, but I'm going to say it probably a couple more times. I am so blessed to have such an amazing network of friends and family and loved ones that have supported me. Even when I was just throwing the idea around, when I'd, when I'd resurrected the idea of me wanting to do the podcast, everybody was so, so supportive and I could not ask for a better group of people. So thank you for supporting me. Here's to, to one month and here's to many, many more months. So <laughs> my goodness. Now, I know that you're looking at the title of this uh, episode and you're like, wait a second, we just did a serial killer in episode four and you're right, but you know what? It's my birthday, so I get to do what I want. <laughs> I had a couple ideas juggling around in the old noggin and I wanted to do something kind of haunted. I also wanted to do something kind of murdery. So we're doing a little bit of both here. A lot of people actually don't know who this person is, and we, oh, you guys are in for a, an absolute fucking treat and a fucking disaster. <laughs> it was one of those cases where when I started researching, I was like, you know, I kind of know what was going on. I didn't realize how bad it was. Just like with uh, Leonardo Cianculi, I didn't know how bad it was. And then as I researched, it got worse. So this killer had brutally tortured and killed an estimated 650 victims. She served as inspiration for Bram Stoker's Dracula, and she also served as inspiration for the villain from Resident Evil Village. I can't pronounce her name. I'm very sorry, those of you that are, like, hitting your heads against the wall right now. I can't pronounce it. I won't try because I love those games and I don't want to disrespect them. Anyway, we are going to be covering, drumroll, I just blinked on her name for a second. <laughs> oh my god, I'm so sorry. <laughs> we are covering Elizabeth Bautery, who is also known as the Blood Countess, and a lot of people are going to tell me, Kate, you said her name wrong. It's Bathory. It's not Bathory. Okay, I double-checked. The, the Google pronunciation key. I YouTubed it. I Wikipedia'd it. It is Bautery because she is Hungarian. Was Hungarian. Maybe she still is Hungarian because there's reason to believe that she still walks the earth. Now, we just established that this case takes place in Hungary. And I want to reiterate from last episode and the episode where we covered Tamara, I am white. The whitest of whites. I would get lost in a blizzard kind of white. 
like my makeup palette is a sheet of printer paper white. If I mispronounce somebody's name, I apologize. I am doing my best. <laughs> so please just roll with the punches with me. I have some names from this case that have uh, an American alternative. I might use that if I think I'm really going to catastrophically fuck up the names. But with all of that said, say it with me, kids. Flip on your nightlight and strap in, because here we go. So Elizabeth Bautery was born Elizabeth Bautery on July 8th, 1560, in her family's castle in near Bautor, a town in eastern Hungary and she was born into one of the most powerful families in all of Hungary. Her father was Baron Hjorhi, or in English, George, Bautery VI, and her mother was Baroness Anna Bautery. The two were actually blood relatives. While marrying or having a child with a blood relative is illegal nowadays, back in the 16th century, it was common practice that was done to keep the royal bloodline unsullied. However, being a child of inbreeding often has very severe side effects. Now, we're going to get kind of sciency for a second. So what happens is when a male and a female animal or human reproduce, the offspring inherits the strongest traits of each parent. It can be something as simple as the eye color or something as complex as health issues or food allergies. Overall, the main goal of reproduction is to create an offspring with the highest likelihood of survival, and in turn, they pass on a combination of the strongest genes. Each human being is born with 23 chromosomes from their mother and 23 chromosomes from their father. Some of the traits that are passed along are dominant, meaning that they are displayed or have a higher chance of being displayed. Things like having blue eyes like your mother or dark hair like your father. However, we also have something called a recessive gene, which is the gene or a trait that doesn't always present itself. Maybe you got your mother's blue eyes instead of your father's brown eyes. In that case, you have a recessive gene for brown eyes. If you meet somebody that also has a gene for brown eyes, the chance of your child being born with brown eyes is much higher. But in Elizabeth's case, we aren't necessarily talking about her eye color, because more often than not, Children that are products of inbreeding suffer from things like blindness, deformities, or other medical conditions. From a very young age, around the age of two or four, Elizabeth began suffering heavily from anger issues, impulsivity, and most critically, epilepsy. Now, seizures normally only last for a couple of minutes, and I personally am very close to somebody that suffers from epilepsy, and those few minutes feel like hours. Once a seizure starts, not much can really be done aside from making sure that that person doesn't accidentally hurt themselves. And if you're curious or if you have somebody uh, in your life, like a friend or a family member who is suffering from epilepsy or seizures, I will put some resources in the very top of the show notes just so that you can educate yourself on what to do if somebody does seize around you. Now, in Elizabeth's case, back in the 16th century, it was common practice for epilepsy to be treated in less than orthodox ways. One of the most common methods for treating epilepsy and other ailments was something called bloodletting. Now, bloodletting is usually done by making small cuts on veins or arteries that let the infected blood escape the body. People suffering from epilepsy were also treated by taking the blood of a non-epileptic person and rubbing some onto the patient's lips, which would, in theory, allow them to absorb the pure, clean blood and treat them. As if Elizabeth didn't have a hard enough life having to deal with those medical conditions, she was also constantly exposed to abuse and violence. Elizabeth grew up in a time where Hungarian forces were constantly at war with the Ottoman Empire. Her parents' royal officers would openly assault, interrogate, punish, and even kill traitors and criminals. Elizabeth was able to find a way to escape from her duties, though. She would often dress in boys' clothing and go into town, and she would play with the local kids. Elizabeth had a lot of potential to be a powerful leader. As we'll discover soon, she was incredibly intelligent. She was unbelievably talented, but it wasn't enough for her. 
Her future was already mapped out in blood, violence, and death. One popular tale that is often brought up from Elizabeth's childhood was of an instance where a man was caught stealing. In some cultures, if you're caught stealing, you get thrown in jail or you pay a fine or other things like that. But for the Bathory family, they had a different way of taking care of business. According to the story, the man was sentenced to death. But how? Maybe he got beheaded or, you know, hanged? Nope. He was sewn inside of the belly of a dying horse. Now, anybody else would have been horrified, but young Elizabeth couldn't pull her gaze away from what was happening. In fact, Elizabeth got a kick out of it. She started laughing. She was enjoying it like she was watching a Saturday cartoon. In 1514, Elizabeth also witnessed the brutal murder of Jorge Dosa, who was a local man that was leading an uprising of peasants. Convicted of high treason and conspiracy, Dosa was executed by being roasted alive. His co-conspirators were also brought in to be punished, and they were tortured, executed, and some of them were even force-fed some of his flesh. Some depictions of the execution show him strapped to an iron chair with hot coals being shoveled beneath it, while a red-hot crown was placed on top of his head, as if to give him exactly what he wanted. Regardless of if the illustration was accurate or not, Elizabeth was present for the execution and enjoyed the spectacle. Although Elizabeth was raised to be Protestant, it was rumored that various family members exposed her to new practices, Satanism and witchcraft. Sadistic tendencies did run in the family, and we can get a good idea of the workings of the Bowtery family from historian Raymond McNally, who wrote, quote, The constant intermarriage among the few Hungarian noble families evidently caused the blood to run a bit thin. One of Elizabeth's uncles was reputably addicted to rituals and worship in honor of Satan, and her aunt Clara enjoyed torturing servants. Many members of Elizabeth's family complained in their private letters of symptoms which showed signs evident of epilepsy, madness, and other psychological disturbances. As time passed and Elizabeth was approaching adolescence, she was described as stunningly beautiful. Elizabeth had been born into one of the most powerful families in Hungary. She had wealth, education, social status, and like I mentioned earlier, she was incredibly intelligent. She could read, write, and speak not one, not two, but five languages. She was fluent in Hungarian, which was her native tongue, as well as Slavic, Latin, Greek, and German. She excelled in mathematics, and she also had an interest in biology, horticulture, anatomy, and astronomy. She was an unbelievably brilliant child, and she had basically everything that she could have ever wanted. The only thing that young Elizabeth was missing was a husband. In 1571, at just 11 years old, it was announced that Elizabeth was engaged to marry 16-year-old Ferenc Nadesti. According to historians, the marriage had been planned when Elizabeth was just two years old. Ferenc's father had risen to power as governor for the Holy Roman Emperor, making his family a force to be reckoned with. The Nadesti family's sudden gain of power and influence made them a prime candidate for a politically charged marriage, which would then unite Hungary with a new ally. Ferenc himself was right in Elizabeth's wheelhouse. He was a strong warrior from a powerful family. He was handsome, he was charming, he knew his way around a sword, and, as we'll get into, he also knew his way around torture. In 1574, before her marriage to Ferenc, Elizabeth became pregnant from relations with a local peasant boy, and her parents were pissed. After years upon years of keeping their bloodline pure, their daughter had tainted it with an outsider. She had fucked it all up with a peasant. Desperate to keep the scandal a secret, Elizabeth's parents gave the baby girl away to a woman that they could trust. She was paid generously for her cooperation, and the woman and her new baby moved to a town called Wallachia. Now, I'd like to believe that this mysterious woman and Elizabeth's child went on to live a full, happy life. But nobody ever saw or heard from them ever again. Ferenc found out what had happened to his future bride, and he was not happy. He attacked the peasant, castrated him, and then let him go, only to later set wild dogs loose to go hunt him down and rip him to pieces. 
On May 8, 1575, 15-year-old Elizabeth and 19-year-old Frank were married at Verano Castle. The wedding was small, only having a guest list of uh, 4,500 people. Among their family members were powerful political figures and ambassadors, including Maximilian II, who was the Holy Roman Emperor. An author by the name of Gabriel Rone wrote, quote, Frank became the youngest general to command the border fortress defenses of southwest Hungary. He gained the high title of Master of the Emperor's Horse. In 1600, Count Nadesti was appointed the commander-in-chief of Christian forces in Transdubia, making him the most powerful person in the country. Although Elizabeth had just married into the Nadesti family, she was adamant about keeping her maiden name, as the Bautieri family was powerful and she wanted it to be known where her roots were. Upon marrying Ferenc, Elizabeth became the Countess of Hungary, inheriting ten castles across the country. Her favorite castle was the Katic Castle, which was located in the town of Katic in western Slovakia on the western border of Hungary. So Ferenc quickly returned to the battlefield shortly after marrying Elizabeth. He became the chief commander of the Hungarian forces, eventually leading them in battle against the Turks during the Long Turkish War. The Long Turkish War, or the Long War, was a war between Austria and the Ottoman Empire that lasted from 1593 to 1606. Meanwhile, Elizabeth was put in charge of maintaining and overseeing her husband's assets, including the castles. Unfortunately, the castles were in areas that were very regularly threatened by the invading Turks. The area surrounding Katic Castle was especially threatened, and a local legend told of several instances where Elizabeth would actually step in on behalf of the local women. She would take them in and provide shelter for them. One woman in particular, whose daughter had been sexually assaulted, found refuge and compassion in Elizabeth's castle. Ferenc would visit his wife whenever he had the chance, and he would entertain her with stories of his time on the battlefield. He knew that Elizabeth wasn't a stranger to violence and cruelty because of her family's practices. He told Elizabeth of how he would use the decapitated heads of his captives to play modern-day soccer, as well as entertaining his wife with the various ways that he would torture and execute people. Now, needless to say, Elizabeth greatly enjoyed hearing all of her husband's stories, but it seemed like she actually got some sort of fucked up sexual gratification from the descriptions. On the surface, Elizabeth was an incredibly hardworking and absolutely brilliant woman. While her husband was gone, she would host various meetings and events with political ambassadors and commanders. These guests were waited on, hand and foot, by Elizabeth's staff of young servants. She was a strict, hard-working woman, and because of her upbringing, she knew exactly how to handle her affairs. Her servants would clean the castle grounds, prepare food, and serve guests. But when the guests left and the grand doors closed behind them, the horrors would emerge. Elizabeth, in mimicking her family and her husband's teachings, would brutally torture her servants. Now, before we continue, I just want to very quickly repeat the warning from the beginning of the episode. This episode is horrendous. It gets so incredibly dark. This is probably the most fucked up case that I've ever researched. So if you are easily upset by mentions of torture, abuse, murder, cruelty, please feel free to click off if you think it'll be too much for you. I will not be offended. I promise. I just want to make sure that you're aware and if this does toe a fine line for you and you're suddenly like, I need to nope the fuck out, that is fine, okay? So, one more time, huge trigger warning, things are about to get bad. It had been clear to Ferenc from the very beginning that Elizabeth had an affinity for torture. Ferenc had ordered a dungeon to be built beneath the castle for Elizabeth to do whatever she wanted. The dungeon was built to her exact specifications, with things like cages, racks, and an array of weapons and tools to use. Some people, normal people, have hobbies like reading, hiking, or other fun things, but Elizabeth's real color shone when she was snuffing out the lives of her subordinates. One of Elizabeth's right-hand people was named Anna de Vula. 
Anna didn't really pop into the picture until 1601, but she was an older Croatian woman who worked for Elizabeth until 1609. She was allegedly a witch, and she introduced Elizabeth to the world of black magic. She would teach her about things such as curses and hexes, but among the many things that Anna taught Elizabeth, she told her to only kill the young girls who had, quote, not yet tasted the pleasures of love. Anna herself was a very violent woman who often participated in torture behind the castle walls. One of her favorite torture methods was to brutally beat, kick, punch, and bludgeon servants and then leave them on the ground until death eventually came for them. Elizabeth and Anna would often serve as some kind of a fucked up tag team, and they would force servants to lay in the snow naked in the winter and then dump freezing cold water on them, leaving them there to die of hypothermia. Servants were often forced to do their work naked, and if they messed anything up, they would be severely punished. Oh, you didn't wash the dishes correctly? Maybe you should be nearly drowned in the wash basin. This blouse wasn't ironed correctly. How about I show you how to iron something by stabbing you with a red-hot poker? Perhaps one of the most famous accounts of Elizabeth's cruelty and temper was the story of an instance where her servant was brushing her hair. As the servant dragged the brush through her hair, she hit a patch that was a bit tangled and the brush snagged, which hurt her. Enraged, Elizabeth struck her servant and drew blood. Elizabeth noticed how the young girl's blood made her skin look radiant and young. This event became the catalyst for Elizabeth's alleged bloodlust. Elizabeth craved young blood, but not in the vampiric sense. She believed that rubbing the blood of virgins on her skin would rejuvenate her. Now, while pop culture depicts that Elizabeth would bathe in her servant's blood, it made more sense for her to use the blood as a sort of lotion to rub on her skin instead of marinating in it like some kind of a fucked up brisket. Because it would take a lot of blood and a lot of victims and the math just doesn't really add up as far as taking a whole ass bath in blood. Elizabeth was also infamous for shoving sharp objects like nails and pins beneath her servant's fingernails. She would also torture servants with things like razors, knives, pokers, and whips. She would rip her servant's teeth out, sew their mouth shut, and she would break their bones. And I have one more trigger warning for you guys, so skip ahead about a minute if you don't want to hear this. Elizabeth drew pleasure from sexual mutilation, often burning, cutting, or piercing her servants' genitals. Servants were kept in Elizabeth's dungeon for days. They were deprived of light, food, and water. When the girls would ask for something to drink, Elizabeth would force them to drink their own urine. Oh my god. One of the many accounts of Elizabeth's cruelty told of a servant girl who wasn't up to snuff with Elizabeth's standards. As punishment, Elizabeth leapt onto the girl and used both hands to rip her jaws open. When Ferenc was home from battle, the conditions didn't improve at all. In fact, they arguably got much worse. Ferenc gifted his wife a device that looked like a glove with knives on the fingers that could be used to scratch and stab victims, kind of like a Freddy Krueger glove. The mere sight of Elizabeth wearing the glove would strike fear into the hearts of every servant on the castle grounds. In one account, Ferenc and Elizabeth took a girl out into the courtyard. Ferenc stripped her naked, covered her in honey, and tied her to a post for an entire day. Critters such as wasps, insects, and wildlife approached her, bit her, and stung her. Eventually, this pain became too much for the girl and she collapsed on the ground, at which point Ferenc took oil-soaked paper or rags, put them between the girl's toes, and lit them on fire to force her to stand up. Elizabeth went on to have several children. There was her daughter Anna, who was born in 1585, Orsolia, who was another daughter, who was born in 1590, Catalin, who was another daughter, born in 1594, there was also a son named Andras, who was born in 1596, and Paul, a son, who was born in 1598. She also had two other sons named Jorge and Miklos, but their dates of birth are unknown, so it's believed that they died in infancy. Andras also died at a very young age, at only seven years old. So Elizabeth's only surviving children were Anna, Orsolia, Kotlin, and Paul. Now, it isn't clear if she forced all of her children to participate in torture, but there was one instance that I found when Elizabeth's daughter, Kotlin, participated in torturing and beating two servant girls. 
Elizabeth and Anna brutally beat these girls, tortured them, and then when they were finished, they set the two girls on fire. So why kill peasants? And we're going to cover this a lot more in depth as the show progresses. A lot of killers believe that some demographics are less than dead. People like vagrants, um, prostitutes, sometimes children, people from a lower class. And as far as these killers are concerned, if you don't have status, power, family, or friends, you are nothing. So why not just take you out like garbage, right? And there is something so unbelievably wrong with that mindset. First of all, they're fucking human beings. And especially in Elizabeth's case, these are children. Like, I... Good God. (laughs) Now, there was one murder that I could find that wasn't of a young servant. And she was an older woman that worked for Elizabeth for years. She had become one of Elizabeth's most trusted confidants. Elizabeth was hosting an event at her castle, but she was short-staffed. I wonder why. And she forced this older servant to dress up as a younger girl. This woman resisted, telling her that, hey, I'm older. There is no way that I can trick people into thinking that I'm a young girl. I have children myself. I have a husband. And all of this resisting royally pissed Elizabeth off. Elizabeth ran outside and grabbed a log and then forced this servant to put a diaper on the log before forcing her to carry it around the castle. Elizabeth followed behind her, yelling, quote, Suckle your child, you whore. Don't you dare let it cry. As if that weren't bad enough, after that event, Elizabeth would go on to torture the woman until she died. Now, this pattern of cruelty continued for years, until January 4th, 1604, when Elizabeth's beloved husband of 29 years, Ferenc Nadesty passed away. Now, all we really know about his death was that he had this debilitating illness, this pain that was in both of his legs, and eventually he ended up being disabled. He was unable to walk. On his deathbed, Ferenc entrusted his assets, including Elizabeth and their children, to a man named Jorge Thurzo, who was actually serving as a Palatine of Hungary. Now, for a lot of people, when somebody near and dear to them passes away, they fall into an extreme depression. And that definitely was the case for Elizabeth. She felt like something was missing from her life. After all, Ferenc seemed to be one of the only people that really understood her. He supported her in so many ways, especially in the torture of their servants. So losing him made things a thousand times worse. Elizabeth became more cruel. Her torture and her killings just became so much more erratic and messy. One of Elizabeth's servants later testified in court saying that things were getting horrendous. These servants were forced to beat each other while Elizabeth watched. And when Elizabeth would torture people herself, whether it was in her dungeon or in various parts of the castle, it got so bad that you could scoop up the blood off the floor with a bucket. In 1610, Elizabeth began telling local nobles that she was starting a young girl's school. You know, she was, in reality, getting tired of just torturing these peasants, these these nothings, these nobodies, this garbage. She wanted more. She wanted excitement. So she told these nobles that she was starting a school to teach their daughters how to carry themselves, how to show etiquette, how to do their womanly duties. And nobody really protested. She was a countess. She was incredibly powerful. She was born of nobility and wealth. She was so intelligent that even if people had their suspicions, when Elizabeth Bowtery asked you to jump, you asked how high. So these girls flocked to the castle and they are never seen again. Just like before, young girls aren't returning home. Meanwhile, Elizabeth's actions begin to catch up with her. Rumors of the disappearances at Bowtery Castle had been circulating since about 1604, with dozens of testimonies and witness statements pouring into the High Court in Vienna. These were statements from concerned citizens, statements from parents, siblings, friends. These people knew that something was horribly wrong, and they were fucking done just sitting idly by while more and more girls disappeared. People had witnessed coffins being smuggled out of the castle in the middle of the night. 
they had heard screams from the victims and laughter from Elizabeth. Two court officials even allegedly witnessed the deaths of young servant girls firsthand. So King Matthias II ordered Thurzo, who was the new caretaker of the Bouchery estate, to investigate and try to figure out what the actual hell was going on. These people finally had enough evidence. On December 30th, 1610, Elizabeth is hosting an elaborate dinner. All of a sudden, her castle is stormed by authorities, with Jorge Thurzo, the man that her husband had so incredibly trusted, leading them. Elizabeth Bouchery and four of her accomplices were arrested under the suspicion of several hundred counts of torture and murder. In October of 1610, the court had received 52 witness testimonies. By 1611, there were more than 300. Many of Elizabeth's servants testified in court, describing the violence that they had seen and experienced in gruesome detail. Her accomplices testified as well, weaving a tale of how Elizabeth forced them to participate. Everybody sang like a fucking canary. So, what happened to her accomplices? Two of her accomplices, Yorna and Detoya, had their fingers ripped off with hot pincers before being burned alive. Janos, who was Elizabeth's third accomplice, was beheaded before his body was burned. And her final accomplice, a man named Ezri, escaped from his holding cell before being recaptured. As punishment for his contribution to the crimes, as well as punishment for escaping, he was burned alive. Elizabeth Bouchery was found guilty of the torture and murder of 80 young girls, although she alleged that she'd killed upwards of 650. Because of her social status and her family's incredible power, she could not be executed. Instead, her sentence was arguably worse. On January 25th, 1611, Elizabeth Bouchery was sealed inside of her castle behind brick walls. These walls had openings just large enough for food to be passed through. Elizabeth would often pass time by reading and writing. When she ran out of books and paper to write in or on, she would write all over the walls. In 1614, Elizabeth signed over all of her assets and land to be evenly distributed to her children. One month later, on the evening of August 20th, 1614, Elizabeth approached the opening in the brick wall. She told the guard that her hands were cold, very cold. The guard replied, quote, It's nothing, mistress. Go lie down. And Elizabeth slept, never waking up again. On August 21st, 1614, Elizabeth Bouchery's lifeless body was discovered behind the brick enclosure in her castle. Her body was later moved to the Bouchery family estate in her hometown in an unmarked grave. Alone, forgotten, and cold. Elizabeth's favorite castle, which was home to the majority of the tortures, Kachtis Castle, is still standing. And for a modest fee, you can actually go in, you can take tours because it does also serve as a museum. And if you have the right connections, you can also spend the night, if you dare. A lot of the people that have visited the castle have reported things such as seeing full body apparitions, whether it was of Elizabeth herself, it could have been a victim, or even just a shadow figure. They've also reported knocking, being touched, grabbed, pushed, or even punched. An EVP, or electronic voice phenomena, is a voice of a spirit that is captured on a recording device. Some of the EVPs that I've heard while researching this case have included things like crying, screaming, and whispering, but I've also heard these little glimpses of either Hungarian or German. If you want to hear more EVPs from the castle, definitely go to YouTube and check them out. There are so many absolutely unbelievable investigation teams out there, and if you want this like secondhand experience without having to actually get your ass to Hungary, that is going to be your next best option. But I think that just about sums up Elizabeth Bouchery for me personally. Thank you all so much for listening as always. I so, so enjoyed covering this topic. 
Uh, admittedly, when I was reading things off, made me a little bit queasy, but <laughs> that's to be expected when you're talking about a literal demon. If you have any recommendations for a future topic, please feel free to let me know. All of my social media information is in the episode notes as well. And if you have any listener stories, I am trying to put together a couple listener episodes for the future. I have a couple stories that have been submitted so far. So if you have any creepy paranormal or true crimey uh, stories that you've personally experienced, feel free to email those to me. Don't be worried about, oh, this is too long. I'm word vomiting. Hello, have you met me? (laughs) Please feel free to be as detailed as you want. If you have any names that you'd like changed in your story, make sure that you do that ahead of time because otherwise, you know, I might just kind of say the names that are written. Also pronouns as well. If anybody featured in your story has a specific pronoun, I want to make sure that I'm respectful of that too. So if you have somebody that uses they, them pronouns, please make sure that you use them. Um, Leave me a little footnote or something like that. And if you have any friends or family members that you think would enjoy this podcast, but they don't have Apple Podcasts, I'm actually working on uploading all of my episodes to YouTube as well. So feel free to recommend me. I greatly appreciate it. I will put my YouTube channel information in the notes too. And if you could, for my birthday, maybe leave me an iTunes review. I'd really appreciate it. I really want to get this show going. So feel free to leave me a review if you think that I deserve it. If not, that's fine. I'll just go cry in a corner. (laughs) And as always, I just want to give a ginormous thank you to my bestest friend in the whole entire universe, Pippin. Pippin is the artist that did the cover art for my podcast. Thank you, Air Freshener, for your endorsement. Um, They are an incredibly gifted artist, and I just like to plug them whenever I can. If you or somebody that you know needs some commissions done for artwork, please feel free to go reach out to them on Twitter. Their Twitter handle is at A-R-C-H-E-R-K-A-S-A-I. They are an absolute wonderful person. I adore them so much. So if you need artwork done, they are the person to go to. But anyway, y'all, thank you so much for taking the time to celebrate my birthday with me here. I so, so appreciate each and every one of you. Make sure that you stay safe, be kind to each other, and stay the fuck away from Elizabeth Bouchery, the Blood Countess. Bye, guys!